With the fall of the Berlin Wall and reunification of Germany in 1989, symbolically at least, the Cold War was over. Perestroika and Glasnost, the dual policy of reform and openness, both key components of Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev's presidency since 1985, had ultimately failed. And by 1991, the Soviet Union was no more. The Cold War was now officially over. Democracy had won out over totalitarianism, and the USA emerged as the sole hegemonic global superpower. The socio-economic model which had heralded in this new golden age of peace and prosperity was neoliberalism. Neoliberalism argued that the greatest obstacle to economic prosperity was state regulation and oversight, and that many of the modest social programs which existed in Western liberal democracies were actually harming the individuals they had been set up to help. Thus, the twofold strategy of deregulation of markets and austerity measures to stop government bloat resulted in exponential economic growth. If there were societal problems, it was the free market through the innovation of private enterprise and not the clumsy state bureaucracy that would solve them. Free trade and expanded markets meant that the third world could also benefit from this growing economic prosperity, supplying the labor and raw materials necessary to feed the tech-based economic growth of the first world. Western foreign policy shifted to the liberation of third world countries from the shadow of the USSR and the installation of liberal democracies in place of socialist dictatorships. This was, if a very simplified overview, the state of the world which was chronicled by Francis Fukuyama in his 1992 text, The End of History and The Last Man. The competing forces of democracy and communism, which had been pushing world history forward since even before the outbreak of the Second World War, had run its course. Democracy had won. This signaled, in Fukuyama's eyes, an effective end to the historic struggle which charted the course of human progress. History, if history could be defined as the series of events pushing human progress to its inevitable end, its final form, if you will, was over. Humanity had arrived at its zenith, a golden age of democracy and freedom, of free people and even freer markets, protected by the watchful and benevolent gaze of the United States of America. Go to work, get paid, and if a terrorist attacked, the U.S. military would protect you. Final Fantasy VII is a multifaceted work of fiction, and while there are many thematic elements that tie the overall narrative together into a more coherent whole, if there is any underlying commentary on contemporary real-world systems, it can be understood fundamentally as an indictment of capitalism. The irony that one of the most profitable video game franchises, made by one of the dominant third-party developers, at least at the time, has an anti-capitalist message at its core is not lost on me. Now, I'm confident the more overt environmentalist messaging is clear and was disseminated sufficiently among the player base that any such commentary would be superfluous at this point. I will be touching on it in so much as a recap of the study of planetary life will be necessary to understand the scientific reality of Gaia, but this aside, I want to focus on the system which in both the world of Gaia and our own has led to untold environmental degradation which imperils the continued existence of human civilization, if not the human species itself. Capitalism. I will argue that Final Fantasy VII is anti-capitalist, but it would be a stretch to posit that it is in favor of any other political or economic framework, as the narrative does not suggest any alternative system. I will be relying upon a Marxist reading of the text, because it is convenient, albeit for brevity's sake, simplistic. The purpose of this video is to introduce the video series as well as establishing the scope of the analysis 
explaining some basic but necessary terminology, and providing the historic and cultural context in which the game itself was developed. If you've come here, I will assume at least some passing familiarity with basic leftist political theory and Marxism in general. So if you don't need a refresher, skip to the timestamp shown here. Marxism refers to the political tradition founded by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in the latter half of the 19th century, as well as derivative political and theoretical schools which develop in the wake of their publications. Marxism is a vast and complex topic in and of itself, so to keep things as simple as possible, one of the central tenets of Marx's thought is that the material conditions of a society, called the base, necessarily determines the kind of society that exists, the superstructure. The relation between the two is predicated on the existing mode of production, that being what is required to produce, called the means of production, things like tools, machines, factories, raw materials, and so on, and who produces, called relations of production, things like the various classes, a capital, commodities, etc. A society then reinforces the existing relations of production through political institutions, education, religion, culture, art, and so on. Marx believed that the capitalist mode of production was necessarily exploitative, where the class who controlled the means of production, the bourgeoisie, exploited the class who did the actual production itself, the proletariat. This was accomplished by paying workers a fraction, called a wage, of the value they produced. A part of the excess value would be put back into the maintenance of the means of production, reinvesting in the company, so to speak, but the rest, the bulk, would go to the owner, increasing their own capital without themselves having to produce anything. This is called the labor theory of value and underpins the power imbalance between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Once a society had developed to a certain level of productive capacity and output, the proletariat would seize the means of production through revolution, which would lead to a period called the dictatorship of the proletariat, where workers, and not owners, were in control of production. Gradually, shifting away from commodity-based production to needs-based production, classes, wages, and currency would disappear. And because of this new relation of production, a socialist society would emerge. Marx's literary criticism, then, tends to focus on ideas like class struggle and how the text reinforces or undermines the existing order of society. It is valuable because the culture and the products of culture, i.e. literature, film, or video game, will necessarily reflect, to varying degrees, the modes of production and how that shapes the texts that are produced. It isn't a one-to-one -one literalistic interpretation, rather, by examining cultural products, we can see how the superstructure reinforces and reproduces the ideology which supports the continued existence of the current base. Now, this is an incredibly brief summary of a much larger topic, so if you have any questions, please ask in the comments below and I'll certainly do my best to answer them. Uh, alternatively, I would definitely suggest perusing the vast litany of videos on YouTube which discuss Marxism in more detail. If things aren't clear, if you're still not sure what any of this has to do with Final Fantasy VII, uh, stick around to find out, because it will also be evident through my examination of the text. For the purpose of these videos, the text that we'll be examining is the original English language version of Final Fantasy VII released on September 7th, 1997 for the PlayStation gaming console. This is the formative version of the game that launched the compilations of Final Fantasy VII in North America, and so I believe is the version of the game most Western fans of the franchise will have been exposed to, and how they originally experienced the game. But to put it into perspective, in less than three weeks of its release, it had already sold 500,000 copies and had surpassed 1 million by early December. Which is not to say that this is the authoritative version of the game. Comparisons between the translation and this version compared to the original Japanese release have been well documented by the Final Fantasy VII fan community. 
many of the subtleties and nuance related to character motivation were altered in the original English translation, to say nothing of the noted poor grammar and word choice. I mentioned this only to set our parameters, since there were changes made to the PC edition released by IDOS in 1989, which is the source for every subsequent re-release on different platforms. These changes were, aside from being more polished, also closer to the original Japanese version of the game. I will also not be examining any of the compilation's material in this video series. Fundamentally, as the earliest title, which was never released in North America before Crisis, didn't come out until 2004, and the first title to be released in North America, Advent Children, didn't see a release until 2006, what they have to add to the overall narrative is too far removed from the text we have in the original North American release to have any influence on either its development or narrative. Admittedly, this means that there will likely be aspects of later compilation material which will both support and subvert my analysis. This is fine. The purpose of these videos will to be examine the genesis of Final Fantasy VII, albeit briefly, to historicize the analysis. Incorporating supplemental materials can only change the text as it existed in 1997, which is antithetical to this project. I fully intend on examining several of these properties, Before Crisis and Advent Children especially, in a latter video series, but let's get there first. Even if these latter properties, or even subsequent translation of the original Japanese text, were the true version, or the plan all along, they are separate entities from the 1997 North American release, and so for now, will not be included. Now, you may say, but how can you ignore these texts if they represent the true or final version of the development team's ideas and intentions? Well, I'll tell you. Roland Barthes, probably the most influential scholar from the Structuralist School of Literary Criticism, published an essay in 1967 called Le Mort de la Tour, The Death of the Author. It is a dense text, and so for our purposes, the central thesis is that Arthurial intent, that is to say, what the author intended to say through their text, based on their own experiences and background, is not necessarily the best way to understand a text. The best way, he argued, is to let the text speak for itself, and for the audience, the reader, the player, to come to their own understanding and conclusion about what the meaning of the text is. Put a pin in this idea, because it's going to be very important as I progress through subsequent analysis. I find introducing even a simplified conceptualization of the death of the author to be helpful when approaching a text like Final Fantasy VII, because it can help to clarify seeming contradictions. Look at it this way. My purpose in introducing the death of the author into my analysis is not to ignore or dismiss the production or historic context the development team lived in. This is actually crucially important to my analysis, to a Marxist analysis. Rather, I want to place the emphasis on what the text says, what Final Fantasy VII has to say about real-world systems and how these views are represented and experienced by the player not getting distracted by what the intention of the development team was, but rather what the text they produced actually says. If this seems a little wonky, I promise that when the time comes, you'll understand why I've taken this approach. Speaking of historic context, let's return now to the end of history. There is some integral socioeconomic background information that will be enlightening and necessary to get the most out of these videos. One of the chief elements, and the heaviest influence looming over the development of Final Fantasy VII, was the Zaibatsu. For those who are unfamiliar with the institution of Zaibatsu, literally, wealth group, they were a type of family-controlled, vertically integrated, monopolistic companies which dominated single sectors of industry in Japan. These companies tended to be dominated by a holding company with its own financial and banking system and a number of subsidiary businesses within specific industries. 
This was the primary model of Japanese industrial organization until their wide-scale dissolution and replacement by the Keiretsu in the post-war economy. Which is not to say that Zaibatsu ceased to exist, only that the dominant position they once held was subsumed by more horizontally organized corporate structures. The monopolistic capital, which underpinned the Zaibatsu system, continued in the post-war years, albeit the control moved from families to shareholders. Culturally, in a wide assortment of popular visual media, Zaibatsu often serve as shorthand for old money, corruption, and the absolute excess of institutionalized capital. So while it is important to consider that Zaibatsu were basically a tired cliché of evil business in the contemporary period the game was developed in, a relic of a bygone era, their shadow nevertheless loomed large. It's also an easy out, so to speak. Look, by the time the game was developed, Zaibatsu were outmoded, so relying on them as the archetype of big bad business was simple. But, just like the contemporary reality where Zaibatsu were understood to be fundamentally flawed models, so too would any monopolistic corporation. It's not indicative of any deeper contemporary systemic issues, it's just a callback to a time in Japan when businesses were corrupt because of family ties and nepotism. The success of the Keiretsu model proved that, once again, the market would sort things out. Then the Japanese economy began to tank in 1990, leading to the period known as the Lost Decade, or Lost Missing score, where between 1995 and 2007, the GDP fell by nearly a trillion dollars while wages stagnated and a third of the Japanese workforce shifted to part-time and temporary employment. This was the state of Japan. Was the socio-economic background noise the lived experience of the development team who produced Final Fantasy VII? It kind of makes sense then that maybe the promise of neoliberalism of unbridled capitalism being the panacea to the world's ills was something that had been overstated. Things weren't great in Japan, and they really wouldn't be for almost 20 years. Is it not then reasonable that some of this antipathy, if even just for novelty, was directed at a foe who had a closer connection with the state of the world? Final Fantasy VII was, after all, the first and last time that the primary antagonist of a Final Fantasy game was not an evil emperor, sorcerer, monster, or demon. It was the Shinra Electric Power Company. I hope you found this video interesting, and I invite your comments below, especially if you have any questions. I'll certainly do my best to answer them, or, if I'm not able to, to send you to resources where you can find the answers yourselves. Please like and share the video if you think it is merited. If you'd like to know when the next video in the series will be released, or if you have an interest in a left-wing perspective on gaming, animation, and swords, subscribe to the channel. Some links to other videos should be popping up any time now. Thanks for your time.